Hello, everyone. Welcome to the today's webinar on why is studying abroad still an attractive option. The session is brought to you by TNI Career Counseling in association with HDFC Credula, India's first dedicated education loan company. My name is Richa Singh, and I will be the moderator for the discussion today. Uh, before we start the discussion, uh, I would like to uh, take the group through certain logistics for the discussion. Um, if you have any questions, kindly use the question and answer tab uh, on your screen. We'll try answering all your questions at the end of the session. Also, we request all of the attendees to stay at mute. We have muted all the participants and to kindly honor that. Thank you. COVID-19 has forced the world to rethink the life as it was. Last couple of weeks hasn't been easy for any of us. It has been particularly most stressful for our student community who have been left in lurch with impending decisions about their education, career, and their future ahead. The intent of this webinar is to provide clarity to the students about the current status at universities. And secondly, to help the student community plan better for their admission process. Before we take the session forward, I would also like to welcome Mr. Davil Mehta. He is the CEO and founder of TNI Career Counseling. TNI Career Counseling is a global admissions consultant for India and abroad for undergrad, masters, and MBA. They provide mentoring, early advising, profile building, test preparation, and admissions and application guidance to the student community. TNI is supported by a team of about 50 plus advisors who support the students in their journey. So with that, I would like to invite Mr. Dhawal Mehta to take the session forward. Hi, Dhawal. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here today. Um, uh, and uh, thanks for the introduction as well. Um, Rahul, can we move to the next slide? It'll be great um, if um, probably they know a little bit about our um, advisors and mentors. Um, and um, so, yes, at TNI Career Counseling, um, our idea is to make sure that we are able to reach out to uh, the student community. We're very student centric. And uh, we have advisors um, who have been through an experience within India as well as abroad. Uh, they understand the challenges that students have, um, you know, while they take that journey, either if it's uh, for an undergraduate, a master's, or an MBA. Uh, as Richard rightly said, right now with uh, the COVID-19 situation, I'm sure most of you all are still worried, uh, concerned about how things are going to pan out. Um, it's an uh, evolving situation. And um, I think um, one of the reasons that we have this webinar today is, of course, to take part of your questions, but also reassure you about how everyone is taking steps um, across the globe, um, you know, to answer many of these questions um, and to work on these issues. Um, so moving ahead to the next slide, um, we have a couple of questions which I'm sure you have in your mind. And one is, what can I do in the time until college starts? I think that's that's um, a fair question for everyone, because I'm sure many of you, um, you know, wherever you are in college, the many colleges have moved towards online courses. And one of the things that I can uh, surely say is that um, what you can really do um, as your exams wind down and you have more time is to look at uh, some of the coursework if you've already got the admissions in place and you know that you are actually going. Um, you know, ahead with your admissions. Uh, then at that point in time, of course, try and prepare for some of those courses, um, you know, that you're going to take up uh, at university level. So if it's if it's masters that you're going for, um, then whatever your specialization is, uh, look at some courses on Coursera, um, which will help you prepare for the early, you know, semester or, or for the semester. I'm sure you have questions on 
um, if I've been accepted, should I actually enroll? Um, what about visa? Uh, you know, am I sure am I going this year or not? So there are a couple of those questions which I will also answer as we move along. Um, but for now, I think it's important that you also look at, you know, even virtual internships uh, this summer. Uh, there are many of them which are looking at uh, providing virtual internships. And as you can see, um, with everyone going online, working from home, um, it's going to be a unique situation for everyone across the world. And so you can utilize this time for yourself well. Um, as I'm saying all of this, I hope all of you all are safe and at home. Um, second question is, is it worth paying expensive tuition fee if the college starts with online classes? Uh, or will there be a reduction in my fee? And one of the things that I wanted is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we've even considered either studying abroad is primarily because you want to make sure that you can go to a campus, um, you know, meet different people, um, you know, use the resources that they have on campus, um, experience the life. And um, I know that um, when, when you have a situation like this, um, the campuses are also now thinking about how to build safety into their system uh, for the students, uh, because I think that becomes very important. Um, and so many of them have actually put an incredible infrastructure already uh, for online classes. Uh, what I understand, many of them uh, already had online classes which they were providing, uh, either through Coursera or their own mediums. Um, and so many of them have already built the capacity to run online classes. Um, and they have, they have done it fairly well. Um, I would say that many of them, before spring semester hit this time, were able to get their classes online. Now, that being said, yes, if you have to take a class online, that might feel challenging for you, especially if it is the first semester. So this is a personal choice. This is a personal choice because you have to remember a number of other factors based on which you could take a decision like this. So my perspective on this is that remember that if you defer your admission by a semester or by a year, that is still pushing your goals out, you know, by a year or a semester. So you have to understand what is important for you as well. Is it, uh, is the importance um, as much given the current situation that you have to be on campus and you want to make sure um, that, you know, you make the best of those resources and, and that's why you don't want to take on online or is it okay for you to take online right now? Um, maybe you don't require you're on campus for this first semester um, and you can take online classes, start with it so that you start with your further education process. Um, as far as the reduction in fees concerned, I'm sure that many of them are considering many of these aspects. In fact, a lot of them are looking at um, taking a pay cut, even though professors are thinking of taking a pay cut um, and trying to manage uh, you know, their budgets in a way that they can pass on some kind of a reduction. Um, so that being said, um, a lot of these decisions are taken from the provost's office. So uh, they're not going to come out that easily. Um, so online classes are an option which is good. Um, I think that you have to take, that's a, that's a personal choice you have to make. Of course, I have a chart of how others feel. We've done surveys. Um, and there are some surveys which are there and, and, and I'll show them to you as well. Um, another thing is how safe will it be to live on campus? And again, we've run some surveys on it and, and you'll find how that actually is. Um, so it would be, so of course, things are gonna change for us whether you are in India or whether you are abroad. Um, you know, people are gonna be more careful when they, when they go out. Um, there's a lot of articles right now where you might have even read that the, you know, the uh, coronavirus situation is gonna be with us uh, maybe for about a year and a half to two years. Um, because by the time the vaccine is out, by the time that you know, um, it's distributed, it, it's, it's using a life cycle to it. Um, and, and so of course, um, you know, we have to be more careful um, you know, sanitation with covering ourselves with a mask, um, you know, to using sanitizers. A lot of this will become a part of reality um, as we even move to campus. 
Um, so I'm sure that many of them are, you know, going to think or are thinking about these measures to make the campus more safer. Um, should I defer my admission to January or to next September? I think I covered this part as well. Um, is that it's a personal choice. I think you need to know what it is that you want from your, um, you know, at this point in time from your education also as well. And uh, if you think that that university going there is important, most of them have their online infrastructures in place. Um, and of course that this, you know, these last couple of months would have been a big learning for them because most of the student community has moved online. Um, and, you know, the best universities will have these resources in place and you'll have even student faculty hours. Um, yes, there's a lot of things that you can do on ground physically that might not happen. So in that first semester, you might do courses that might be slightly different. You might not see all the courses being offered. Um, so there are gives and you know there are advantages to this uh, as well as disadvantages, but you have to measure what's most important. Um, will deadlines to pay the deposit fee to colleges be extended? I, I think yes. Um, it's also from case to case basis because most of the universities that they've given you a date, um, you know, unless you write them an email and let them know, uh, they're going to take it seriously. Um, and, and probably you might have to pay on time. Um, let me move on, um, you know, to other slides. Um, so this is just giving you brief updates as we've heard from, you know, University of California, Purdue, Michigan. Uh, this is for the US. Um, so many of them are also, um, you know, uh, suspending some of the requirements which they have, um, you know, uh, before they give out this. Some of them are subjective admissions and uh, some of the requirements have been eased um, even going forward. Uh, with the exams and things of that sort because you are seeing that test prep centers are also um, you know seeing um, an issue because many of them had physical centers and of course didn't have an online exam and you know they're all accommodating to building an exam now um, which can be which can be proctored online so um, you're going to see that update also as you move along right? is that um, you know uh, the SAT the ACT, uh, all of them are actually, you know, trying to gear up for this as well. Um, the dates are still uh, open. The, the June dates are open. The April dates are canceled. Somewhere the May dates are canceled, but the June dates are still open for registration. Um, uh, so I think we will find those updates. But as far as US is concerned, uh, they all are saying that they that you can defer admissions. You can you can write them an email and ask for payments to be made late for the deposits. Um, and you know any enrollment extensions are being also provided. Uh, so you should personally touch with the universities. Um, on to the update for uh, UK. Um, um, so university updates is um, you know there's a two-week pause which most of the universities are asking uh, that let us just wait and this was put out on 23rd of March. Um, wherein they just want to make sure that there's a two week pause before we can actually take decisions and they're asking students to wait. So you'll hear more from US university and from UK universities as well. Uh, the same with EU, um, you know, it's um, if, if you're stuck, you haven't taken the TOEFL or the ILTS, uh, they are being considered at this point in time and they're saying we understand uh, and whenever you can take them, um, when you know and how that might be as you move along you can submit the results to them as well um rahul can we move to the next slide as well um of course what what you know um we have this presentation but i'm sure that you will have questions also after this but uh, if you want to see any of the updates that we've put also on this slide uh, rahul can you just share what we have of ours uh, so that you can find any of the updates as well um, you know, Rahul will just share with you. Yeah, so we have a website with COVID-19 updates as well for, you know, US, UK, Canada, and other countries as well. So you can always, um, you know, try and and um, uh, you know um, hit the tab for that and share that uh, link also to you on the chat so that you can have that link as well. Um, um, so I just put that in the chat button. Um, also coming back to um, the updates um, for Canada. Uh, Canada has also been very flexible uh, for you know universities across uh, whether you know um, they're absolutely okay with you um, you know deferring the classes. Uh, many of you would have also you know heard back from them uh, in this case, and uh, so I would suggest is that 
be patient. Everyone um, abroad is very cooperative at this time. Um, they're not being very strict with their deadlines and you will not see um, an issue going forward. Um, I think that the situation, yes, in the US uh, has been accelerated uh, more recently, uh, COVID-19. And um, of course, it doesn't mean um, that, you know, um, the the sessions won't go on. As I said, um, you know, the online sessions is definitely a possibility for fall semester. Uh, it's your personal goals in terms of how it is that you want to, uh, you know, go ahead with an online session this fall, or do you want to defer your admission to spring or then the fall after? Um, as we move along uh, from Canada, Rahul, next slide. Um, So this is um, a snap it is also an update which is basically a link that you can see on our website where um, we have someone um, in the US who's actually built an entire list of over 300 universities in terms of when their classes went online uh, and if you want to you can click on that that actually has a lot of useful data as well um, so you know once you go on our website you'll get a lot more of that information um, in addition to that um, you can always get updates on our Instagram, um, you know, uh, channel. So Rahul, do you want to show that also to them? So we're actually hosting a whole lot of, um, you know, uh, updates. Um, and what I would suggest is that you all can also do that um, is go to Instagram and, then, you know, just go to our handle. Uh, uh, you'll get all the, you know, information that you require. Um, so moving back to the presentation. Um, again, the test preparation updates. Um, so the ACT, which is the undergraduate exam, um, is moved to June and July. The uh, April exam was canceled. Um, GRE at-home testing is available worldwide. So earlier they only did it for a few countries, but now it's available online. It's a proctored exam. Um, you need to have a laptop in place and you need to have one webcam so that you can take the exam. Um, you'll get the scores also, um, you know, right away in terms of um, you know your sectional scores but maybe not writing um, TOEFL um, is also expanded its availability to a special home edition test um, oh, you know all of these details are again available on our website and that gives you the links to go um, to the separate pages as well um, GMAT as well is going to start being available from mid-April uh, online um, so you know uh, GMAC which is a website is going to update more about that soon um, IELTS has cancelled all its April test dates and, uh, you know, postponements at a zero fee. Uh, cancellations are at a full refund. Uh, so wherever you've made any payments, etc., they're going to all move these across. But remember, everyone's moving online. You're going to see a difference in terms of the tests. Um, so you should not be worried. Um, let's moving on uh, to the next slide. Um, now I think we get to a part where uh, we've already you know spoken about COVID-19 and I want you to see some of the surveys that were actually run and what the respondents had to say. So here the question is what changes would you take into consideration um, and many of them um, and this is this is for you know home versus the ones who are uh, you know thinking about study abroad um, and so these are in the home countries and they're saying that you know we, they, we might postpone uh, you know until the next semester. Um, and many of them are, and those who are actually considering that are also, and, and many others are looking at enrolling in online courses. Um, many are thinking of going to a different country, or um, you know, uh, some of them are thinking that maybe they might not go, um, you know, or not study it, you know, not study at all. So 10% are saying they might not study at all. But uh, many of them, if you can see on the left corner of the pie chart, is that did they? Many of them want to change their, you know, um, their study plans, and 68% are saying no. Uh, so a large portion still want to stick to what they want to do um, and they're okay with the alternative in terms of online classes. Um, moving on to the next one, um, survey two, which is essentially uh, focused on respondents staying abroad. Here again, you can see slightly a smaller number. So 60% are saying, no, they're not going to change their uh, plans. Um, only 22% want to postpone uh, until next year. Uh, most of them want to take their online courses, etc., and and you know go ahead with their plans. Uh, survey two, which is the next one, which focuses on 
um, respondents studying in their home countries. Uh, what is, you know, or how important are the following measures in a university? And you can see that many of them have said better hygiene around campus, um, having a helpline 24 seven, um, extending the application period, uh, online counseling and support. So everyone is looking at all these factors as they're moving along. Um, you know, um, so you can see that um, this is this has become important to the student community as well as the institutions, and I'm sure it'll be addressed as you're moving along. Uh, survey two, this one was for home country, and as you move along for the study abroad, which is the next slide. Um, um, so the ones we were responding were saying, um, for them, the most important is, uh, you know, again, better hygiene and then have a headline extending the application period. So extending the application period is what many of them have been asking for, and I'm sure that this, that's what is actually happening on ground. I see that many of the dates have also been pushed. Um, so moving on uh, to the next one. Um, now we'll just come to a part. So I hope that, that, that your COVID-19 questions might have been addressed at this um, if you have any questions, you can put it um, on the box. Uh, there's a questions you know, box. Uh, you can ask us any of those. Now, why study abroad? Um, definitely, that's a question for many of them who are considering a study abroad. And um, um, what I would mention, and moving to the next slide, is that if you see traditionally, many of them, um, right from, now we've given you a 2000, 2016 chart, and you can actually see that you've seen an, you know, um, a distribution difference across, um, and how many of them have actually been studying, you know, in different countries, um, and and you can see that there's definitely seen a huge increase in the number of students who are looking at studying abroad, um, and there's a reason to it, right? Um, so if you're looking at undergraduate, uh, we we increase. Um, in, a, in, in admissions for the undergraduate process, it's been it's probably the most challenging category today, um, because if you look um, at specific top universities in the U.S., the number of applications for an undergraduate admission have over the last, say, five to six years, have doubled. Um, so I would say that you know if there were 40,000 applications, you've almost seen that go up to about 75 to 80,000 applications, um, and so the undergraduate become from that perspective in terms of application. Uh, they've seen rising numbers, but still you would see maybe 15% of you know, the Indian diaspora will probably look at a study abroad uh, for an undergraduate versus 50 to 55% looking at a study abroad um, you know, uh, for a master's or an MBA. Um, so that's what our next slide will also tell you, um, is um, that you are seeing 15% of that bio study abroad for UG versus 55%. Um, you know, so 55% of them from uh, the ones who are pursuing an undergraduate are looking for a postgraduate or a graduate degree. Um, and the advantages of, of, of course, studying abroad is the access to resources, um, faculty, uh, multiple choice and inter interdisciplinary coursework, uh, balanced curriculum, um, theory, practical application. Uh, the diverse peer group. Uh, so I can give you my example also. Um, you know, I did my high school here um, in uh, India, and then for my undergraduate, I went to University of Michigan. Um, now I was in the engineering department the first time because I was doing computer engineering, and then I decided later after the first year that um, you know I would also want to study economics because I really liked that subject when I took it as an elective, and um, I moved to the School of Literature, Science and Arts, which also had computer science as a major. And then I was able to complete both requirements for economics and computer science. Um, so I took my first internship, you know, in my end of my sophomore year um, as uh, in Microsoft and then uh, post that um, in, my, in my junior year and I went to Goldman Sachs um, for an internship in investment banking. And so I really got um, a very good um, understanding in terms of what I really wanted to do as I as I reached my senior year and um, that helped me when I was looking for jobs placements um, I had access to the career office I had access to my peer group um, and that really helped me find what I wanted to do um, so for me that education was very valuable uh, the four years that I spent uh, 
course, I built a network even while I was working. Um, and then, you know, after about uh, four years, I applied uh, and I was in New York. I was in Bank of America and then I applied to Columbia University for a master's in economics. And uh, that's when I decided uh, that, you know, I want to pursue economics and not maybe an MBA uh, because of, I was fairly interested in, in, in policy and decision making. Um, and my final thesis was, uh, you know, uh, was more towards um, venture capital and uh, hedge funds. Um, and uh, when I graduated, I, I ended up working with a venture capital company, uh, helping them with their, uh, you know, policy framework. Um, and um, while they actually uh, were starting their offices in Singapore and India, I was able to play a role there. Um, and, and so that's how I've been able to transition, you know, through my career. That's the opportunities that I received, uh, which I'm very thankful for. And uh, that have got us or have got me to this role that I can actually explain to you all about the benefits of really having um, an education abroad. Um, so, it, it, and, and today I think that, that um, opportunity is is almost available in all developing countries. Um, you know the opportunity to actually interact with um, you know a diverse audience, um, um, and I think that I have friends across so many countries, um, and it really helps me um, well reach out for information or anything of that sort. Um, we have alumni groups. Um, you know I've personally been involved in alumni. Um, I'm the vice. University of Michigan alumni, and uh, I think it's it it plays a pivot for you as you move along uh, and consider you know studying at the university is that you know the alumni groups really do help you also with your future career decisions as well. Um, moving on um, is um, you know just giving you a little bit of a benefit of undergraduate versus postgraduate, most of which I've sort of gone over already. Um, maybe you can move to the next slide, Rahul. Um, so popular study abroad majors. I'm sure that many of you already know this, um, but I think this is just a slide we wanted to put in. Just give you a fair idea about um, what what are some of the other majors that you could look at and which are popular. Um, uh, slide 19 actually shows that uh, more appropriately. Uh, Rahul, can you click on it, please? So uh, popular study abroad majors is um, in the STEM field is biological engineering uh, or sciences and then um, engineering, computer science, data science, cognitive science, pharmaceutical science, so a lot of this um, in the STEM field that you see. Um, of course, um, you know, for MBAs, it's, it's, it's slightly different. You, you're also seeing a lot of STEM MBAs come through. Um, you know, primarily in data science or, uh, you know, business analytics. Uh, so it allows you to sort of stay back longer in the U.S. because you get three years of a visa. Um, so you get something like an, um, so an OPT, which is an optional practical training, is and then you get an extension for another two years uh, based on the fact that you're a STEM student. So your degree needs to show that, uh, that you took a course which was approved by the U.S. Um, immigration Authority. Um, and they have a website for that as well, where you can check if your major and, and your course, you know, technically uh, is uniform with their requirements. Um, then social science, of course, courses in business, economics, social sciences, psychology, uh, government, political science. As a matter of fact, um, Richard can tell you more about her experience of uh, psychology because she studied um, in Columbia University with her master's in organizational psychology. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, hi, Dawal. Thank you so much. Sure, very quickly. So I graduated, I did my MA in social organization psychology uh, from Columbia University, and I think it, it was an amazing experience. Uh, not just, uh, you know, within the Columbia University, you can actually take up courses uh, at different schools, and that's what I did also. I had a keen interest in gender, so I took up a course at SEPA and, stand, uh, and studied gender politics and development. And I think all of that, uh, and I did my internship with United Nations. So all of that actually deeply helped me in navigating and transitioning to this new career that I wanted to uh, nurture in the development sector. Thanks, Avil. Over to you. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, moving on, uh, we also see government, as 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 Richard said. So SIPA is very well known also um, for um, you know, government and, 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 you know, public policy. So that's definitely a great, you know, area. 
Uh, and I think that arts, so arts is also very, very, you know, popular uh, across and, and, you know, maybe if you want to consider English language, literature, communication, um, you know, uh, a lot of these things are, are something that you can consider while studying abroad. Um, that doesn't mean that if you have certain other majors that you want to explore, many of them, which are sort of, you know, careers that are um, non-traditional, um, you can definitely consider them abroad because many of them are, um, you know, many even for the graduate level courses are are fairly well known for it. Um, so sure, let's move ahead. Um, so uh, prepare for admissions. Now this is what a lot of people really want to know, um, and um, the one way we look at it is that it's it's definitely an overwhelming process. So. You want to think about this deeply. Um, you want to think about what matters to you. You need to have the goals in place. Um, and that's why what the next slide is going to tell you about is a little bit about the goals that you should have in place. So identify your interests, uh, whether you're in high school or undergraduate, um, you know, uh, in college. I think um, taking courses that interest you, um, you know, you should try to probably try to eliminate things that you don't want to do early on. Um, and pursue only interests, you know, things that you're interested in, take internships, courses, projects, all of those things really help you out. Uh, I would also ask you that do as much uh, community service work you can, you know, do a, you know, do a program in financial literacy um, for a community. Um, you know, right now is a good time where you can see a lot of them uh, trying to hand, um, you know, hand out food parcels. Uh, do much for the community because that's where the need is. Um, you know, having that also um, in addition uh, will help you a lot. Um, so strengthening your skill set, leaning on them, um, you know, either during class side, uh, that'll help you identify a lot of your career goals. And then the next thing should be, of course, once you know that, once you know this is what you want to do, for you to look at the country and their requirements and see if your goals fit in with that country um, and then start doing research uh, in terms of the programs that you're interested in look at their requirements uh, do these programs strengthen your skills in your area of interest do they provide you the opportunity to grow perform um, will they springboard you either into academia or the industry uh, that's very important then start shortlisting your universities uh, talk to your students you know students who are already there and then you know you can reach us um, at TCC, and our experts can help you out with this process. That's where we 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 think it's most important is the early advising part, where we sort of guide you through the process. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, one of the other things which you you should do is follow a process so that you can apply in time. So check for the required exams, um, whatever you require in terms of academics. Um, the extracurricular leadership and community service. Um, and if you need to take a test to qualify for your course, practice hard to get the good grades. Uh, you know, um, if it's undergraduate, you know, there's a scholastic aptitude test or the American College test or GRE, the graduate record examination or the GMAT uh, or the ILTS. Now, we had separate seminars uh, for, you know, a GRE versus GMAT or an IELTS versus TOEFL. Um, you know, you, you could always look that up. We have that on our website as well. Uh, if you have any questions, you can post that to us. Um, you know, start starting your applications once you've seen the requirements and you've worked on it um, is very important. But building your CV also, you know, uh, making sure you have a resume. Uh, many of these formats are available, even some resources are available on our website, but many of these are available. You should make sure that you have your resume in place. Um, and then start your application. Make sure you know the deadlines. Uh, many a times you have early deadlines and you can use those deadlines early on. So if you're right now in April, you, you think that you want to apply in 2000 and, you know, uh, for, for fall 2021, you have to look at early deadlines. So if you're in it right now, look at early deadlines. Some, some of them even start as early as September. So if you're especially looking at MBA deadlines or graduate deadlines, um, you know, wherein you're applying for an early, uh, you have to make sure that you can apply, you know, um, sooner than later. And so if you do, you have higher chances of admission as well. So it's, it's, it looks like you've planned yourself well. So if you're sort of in April, you have the next couple of months to prepare for all the aspects. Uh, that's what I would suggest. And um, 
that smoothens out your process. Uh, even your acceptance increases the, because you're putting in so much effort. This takes a lot of effort. Um, and then post you finishing the application. Um, and that's and that's one of the things that I would think about us is that we try to help you build that roadmap. Uh, really build that roadmap in terms of how do you need to approach uh, you know, your applications, where and how you need to finish you know, either your test prep, either your other requirements, and many a times we try to help you do that much early on. You know, we have students who come in a year ahead of time also and be able to help them out. Um, even if you come six months ahead, we are still able to help you out. But remember that the pressure is on you. Um, um, post that, there's of course, and you know, the offer acceptance, the visa and financials, where you know you have to pay a deposit, you have to apply for the I-20. Um, if it is, you know, the U.S., if it's um, Canada, there's a study permit. Um, and there are you know different requirements for the study permit. If it's UK, then you need to have a CSR number. Once you have that, then you know you need to make sure that you take you know your your first year fee and freeze it for 27 days and then apply for the visa. Uh, so three country options also. Uh, so you need to know all of those things as well. Um, as far as accepting the final school that you want to go to, um, you really need to make sure that you build a list for yourself in terms of what is it that you want from your experience um, after you've got all your, you know, your admits and then decide where you want to go. Um, moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> so um, I, I just briefly went to the US visa, you need, you know, um, so you get an I-20, based on that you will get an F-1 visa. Uh, right now, um, and there's a slide on this also later as you go, uh, the U.S. Embassy is closed. We don't know exactly when it's going to open. Um, uh, you know, I think that's an evolving situation. Um, but right now, even if I actually look at the, the next, you know, date which the U.S. is actually showing for the um, visa process starting, not even at the end of this year. So it's actually very early next year, and um, that's why it's a very evolving situation. Um, that doesn't mean the date can't change. Uh, they could they could sort of you know um, uh, prepone that date as well, and and you know we'll 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 get to know that as we move along. Um, so you have to keep uh, yourself updated with all this information, and you can always reach our website for it. Um, again, HDFC Credula is our loan partner, and you know they would. Uh, definitely be the ones who will help you out with the collateral or the non-collateral loan. Um, you know, and and remember this is that it definitely helps to have your finances in order while you're getting the visa. So I encourage that you always have loan documents in place, just in case your bank statements, all of those you know things don't come in place, visa rejections. Um, so having you know um, secured a loan, it would help you a lot with the visa process. Uh, it ensures that you know that goes smooth. Um, and also, one of the things you must know, and I'm sure HDFC would be able to tell you, is that depending on your GRE, GMAT score, if you're looking at you know collateral loan, non-collateralized loans, your interest also can vary because they do give an emphasis for you know your preparation. Uh, uh, um, you know, FCM Travels is our travel partner, and we can help with uh, with the ticketing, with the foreign exchange, all of that as well. Uh, moving on. Um, the next slide, yeah. So this slide is for undergraduate. What are the things that you require? So this is more or less something that we've put together, and it's it's by country. We're saying India, US, UK, Canada, others. How much preparation do you really need, right? So for the SAT, you can try ahead of time uh, because it takes you a year sort of to get you know to the time that you apply. Um, the SAT two, um, you know, which is a subject test. Um, you know, you should. You know, this, the U.S. typically, you know, would like to see that, and and you taking it about six months ahead of time is helpful for you because if you don't score the required amount, you know, score, then you can take it again. So remember that, you know, you should always attempt to take a lot of these test preps, you know, a year ahead of time. That really helps you. Most of the scores last at least three to five years. Um, so you have three to five years to show that same score, so you can start early on. Um, even though many of them will say five years, but three years is is a reasonable time you must assume. Um, again, um, you know, moving on to the next uh, slide. Um, so that was undergraduate. Now this is the basic requirements for programs in undergraduate. Um, you you know this is again looking at most of the you know uh, top universities. 
the us requires a more holistic profile um so if you are someone who's consistently good at academics um either a good id score uh, isc or hsc uh 12th grades they really uh, help you a lot an sat or an act score uh between you know a 1300 to a 1590 for an sat uh, south asian candidates tend to have higher scores so the higher the score the the more improved your chances are as well and then you know act uh, again um you know 31 to 35 uh, the sat 2 you should have a minimum of 700 as a score out of 800 uh advanced placement a minimum of a four if you want credits for it um two to four years of <clears throat> focused extracurricular activities Uh, participation and winning in Olympiad state level competitions are very helpful. Uh, community service recommendations and essays, all of these um, are sort of required for your application process. And so, typically, you take two years, three years to really build your profile up, um, you know, for undergraduate. So we typically tell students right who graduated after the tenth grade that start focusing on, you know, um, uh, abroad. At least answer that question: Do you want to do this or not? And then, you know, start working towards it. um so have one session maybe when you try and decide that if you can you can build it up and then have a session right after you graduate from tenth um moving on um for the you know this is for the post graduate um gre gre subject test gmat tofel community service academics extracurriculars building relationship with your professor your manager if you're working uh shortlisting universities application process all of this uh this is sort of a timeline that we have given um that you can consider um and you know your academic timeline is typically 3 to 4 years even if you're engineering yes your your cgpa for 4 years is valuable so maintaining something above a 7 is is crucial um otherwise you'll have to sit and explain a lot of these things in your additional information section um and so uh it's important that you do uh if you're applying for undergraduate your 10th and 12th grades are important uh well even your 11th but for post graduate you know your your 12th grades are not as important your four years or your three years that you've been a part of uh, are important um whereas in the in canada and the uk they do mention to you that you know many universities will say only the last two years is important um so this chart will give you a little bit of an idea in terms of you know how to prepare moving on um these are requirements basic requirements for masters you know abroad um, mba would be slightly you know uh, different because you need more work experience but otherwise um, if you look for both of them a consistently good academic grades um, uh, for you know uh, or either an upward sloping curve so a 7 to a 9 is what i would suggest even though we've written 6.5 um, if you don't have it yes you know um, Uh, a gmat or a gre score can offset it to some to some extent but that's if you actually also have experience uh so with the experience with that uh gmat gre score i typically ask candidates to take a year's experience before going it does help you um and um so moving on um you know this is fairly similar um having uh you know um a lot of these requirements do help you now how to choose a country what we've what we've done very simply here and and quickly is um if you want to choose a country moving through the next slide um you know um every country has different things that you can you can look at so you know maybe you know us for instance it is expensive but they provide you a lot of scholarships for graduate programs um especially if you're a good student so you know it it becomes attractive for stem majors um for mba stem also it becomes attractive um so that's why considering the us would be good but then it is challenging to get the h1b um you know get a uh, if you want to stay back and get a green card all of those things need to be you know assessed so you need to know your goals first in terms of what you want do you want to stay back there uh do you want this degree because you want to build the peer group what are the things that you really want from it and that's how you can you know decide which countries and so what we've done if you just look next um the next slide actually gives you uh we've built a sort of a chart which will also help you understand um that for undergraduate applications this is sort of the factor and the country and we've created this kind of a rating uh that you know for academics uh, this is what we feel about a country is it high so is it low high medium and then we've given you an uh, given that country an aggregate 
overall value. Um, and also this, this gives you the factor of budget, scholarships, choice and quality of institutions, visa status, uh, availability of jobs, research in academia, um, you know, ROI, reputation of college, quality of life and academics. So all of these are combined into one. Um, so if you look at this, it might give you also a better idea. Uh, now this is based on our research and opinion and uh, you can find this also on our website. Um, this is for undergraduate. The next one is for graduate. Um, and you'll see some of the differences here also um, where we've actually feel that, you know, it's sort of high. So we put, you know, USA, Canada, UK sort of, you know, in that, you know, high, maybe UK or medium to high zone. Uh, but these are all good, uh, you know, to consider as you move along for a postgraduate degree. Uh, moving on. So STEM MBAs, just briefly going through STEM MBAs, um, since we have only five minutes. Um, um, STEM MBAs are an acronym, so you know what the acronym for STEM is. And uh, STEM MBA is a perfect fit for students coming from a science technology background. Um, and this is definitely, the reason that they've come up with this also is because there's a shortage of STEM workers. Um, and you're gonna see that ongoing. And MBAs are typically two-year degrees, but some STEM MBAs have also become one year. So, um, and these STEM MBAs offer a 36-month OPT. So, moving on, um, we've just given you a couple of uh, names of universities um, which you know offer STEM MBAs. There are about 14 of them here. Um, you can always find that on our website as well. Um, and the next slide gives you a little bit of a sense of the Cornell MBA. Um, and the class profile so that you'll have an idea of, uh, you know, the tech MBA, what it is like, the average age is about 28. Uh, there are only 84 enrolled, so you can imagine that's a small class, so that means it's competitive also to sort of get in. Uh, you can see, you know, the um, uh, number of female students seems to be a little bit lower, um, but uh, you can see the backgrounds where their undergraduate majors would have been, engineering, computer engineering, economics, uh, business administration um, and so there's a lot of diversity here so that's the good news uh, you know if you want to consider a stem mba um, and even the gmat is not very high they're, they're looking at you know maybe a 700 or here it's even an average of 693 um, and and so you really you know you can focus on a stem mba as well uh, moving on um, yes is this the q a section or yeah so this is how do i build for a top MBA is be certain of a path, uh, be a part of an exclusive club if you are already working in an upcoming startup or an established company that will definitely reflect well, take on responsibilities that others can't or won't, create new learning curves, uh, business projects of strategic importance, um, you know, be ahead of the race, shoulder bigger responsibilities, be part of anything which is, you know, um, which is also um, something that you're passionate about, maybe, in a, you know, a sport. Um, also, uh, at your workplace, EQ plus IQ, showing maturity and attitude and professionalism, uh, achieving a balance is also important. Uh, 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 these are just current visa updates. Um, this is one slide, which kind of gives you a sense of, um, you know, uh, country-wise, if you look, USA, UK, Australia, Canada, Germany, and um, you can see that, you know, if you're migrating, uh, USA is closed, UK is still open, Australia is open, Canada, um, only the ones that are selected until a certain date. Um, so I think that that was 23rd, 2020, I think that was wrong. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, and Germany, again, open only work permit and dependent applications. Uh, consulate closed for new applications. UK again closed for temporary visa applications. Closed for so if you can see that everywhere you're seeing things closed right now, and everyone's actually giving aid to people who are there who are working. There's a high number of unemployment claims that have been filed because people are in a lockdown at this point. But that means that as things open up, all of these things are going to change. And remember that if there are deferrals, I can tell you one very big factor to consider is that the applications to universities, people go back to study when there are times of a recession. So imagine that, you know, things that we see right now, the economy is going to take somewhat of a hit. So you're going to see a sort of 
maybe a, res a, re a recession set in for some period of time. And for the economy to bounce back, it might take another year, two years, you know, we don't know at this point. But that means there'll be more applications as you move along. And so it's going to become more competitive as well. So you need to prepare yourself better. And especially if more people try and defer the admissions, that will actually go into the next year's quota. So then that means there are going to be less, even less more admits given or, or less admits given as you move along. Um, so you need to be clear about that as well. Uh, moving on, I think I'm fairly done with my presentation, but you know, if you have any other questions, so this is our alumni, uh, you know, of course, students who've, um, who've completed, um, you know, with us undergraduate and masters, uh, they've been to different universities in the world. Um, and you know we've seen um, a hundred percent success rate with with our our applicants um, getting into the colleges um, and so we, we we the way we work is that we do an online session a personal session uh, walk you through um, you know make you give a career test and then help you with um, you know uh, your requirement you to short uh, build a roadmap for you uh, help you even with test preparation. So whether if it's for GRE, GMAT, you know, undergraduate test preparation, SAT, ACT, TOEFL, TS, and make sure that you universities, make sure you get your visa, your ticketing, your foreign exchange, everything, right? Um, so our services, as you can see, is life coaching, mentoring, college application guidance, even summer school, test prep coaching, extracurricular, building your profile, your CV, all of that. Um, and uh, you can of course reach us there is a contact number as well here um, uh, so you can reach us uh, and now open for q a if we have a couple of minutes um, i'm happy to take any questions uh, richard um, i think you would have seen it right yes Tavil. so one of our attendee wants to know that if there is any delay or cancellation of september 2020 intake due to the COVID impact unfortunately they've not mentioned the country right so um i mean if they would have that would have been good but you know what i would say is that i'm going to put that here in terms of the question um that everyone said is is you know thank you for the valuable sections is there any delay or cancellation of september september 2020 intake due to covid or any due to this crisis and i think that again this is an evolving situation the universities none of them so far have said we're going to cancel uh, many of them are looking at online sessions so they would probably do an online session, give you the option that, you know, you can actually do online sessions. I don't think the university will cancel the semester. They will keep an online session and give you a deferral. So you can defer by one semester and maybe start in January term instead of, you know, the September term. Um, so either they'll say, okay, you can come online and maybe we we'll, won't charge you so much money. We'll give you some kind of, a, you know, an amount of tuition waiver. And then you can take the semester and then the next semester you can fly in. Uh, if that semester is not available, you can take that also online with a reduction fee and then maybe you can come in, you know, uh, later. So that's why it's an evolving situation, but I don't see any cancellations right now. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, Dhaval. So uh, with that, we come to an end of the uh, webinar. Um, as Dhawal mentioned, it is a personal uh, journey. However, there are resources available for students that students can utilize. Remember to clarify your goal, do lots of research and uh, connect with people. There are resources like TCC available for you to help you to make better decisions. Also, uh, kindly uh, give us feedback about the session through the link which is now available or on your chat box. And thank you so much again. Uh, stay safe and stay at home. Thank you so much, Naval. Thank you so much, everybody.